Welcome, everyone. I want to welcome you all. My name is Cheryl Cato, and I am the Executive Director, and I am also a Child and Family Therapist here at the Rainbow Project. We're very excited. This is the second in a series through April, Child Abuse Prevention Month, National Child Abuse Prevention Month, and we're excited that you're here. And um, I want to make sure we um, <clears throat> introduce uh, our inspiring speaker today. Uh, so I want to just not waste time and let's, let's definitely begin. Um, Dr. Ryan Haranga is the Director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and a professor at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. He is a pediatric psychiatrist and neuroscience uh, neuroscientist working with neural uh, substrates of childhood traumatic stress and PTSD. And he directs the Building Resilience After Adversity in Youth, or the Brave Research Center, which seeks to <clears throat> which seeks to map neurodevelopmental trajectories following childhood trauma. And he's also certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He's also a member of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the Society of Biological Psychiatry. We are grateful and honored um, that he is talking with us today and um, be ready. Um, it is a pleasure tonight to um, introduce him. His topic presentation is Intergenerational Trauma, Brain Development and Mental Health in Youth. So everyone, please welcome uh, Dr. Ryan Herenda. Thanks so much, Cheryl. That's a really kind introduction. I'll, I'll do my best to live up to it. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, let me start my screen share. So again, it's really nice to be here and an honor to be presenting as part of the series in and for the Rainbow Project. Uh, the, the work that Rainbow is doing is really incredible. Uh, for our community and uh, share all your leadership and, uh, and the work of all the folks at Rainbow is really inspiring. Um, I'm going to talk to you all tonight uh, a bit about some of the work that's being done in my lab as well as uh, other labs that's looking at impacts of trauma exposure in youth and, and, and also um, really beginning to dig into intergenerational trauma uh, as well, which is uh, at least from the neuroscience standpoint, a relatively new research that I'll tell you about and how that impacts mental health and youth, both in terms of um, resilience and vulnerability. So here are the objectives for the talk and I'm hoping to leave some time uh, at the end for questions as well. So um, uh, hopefully we'll uh, uh, and also be mindful of folks' uh, Zoom exposure. I know a lot of people are getting virtually fatigued these days, so I'll try to um, keep you all interested and um, the, keep the, the, the talk and the slides succinct too. So we'll talk a little bit first about the health consequences of trauma in youth with a focus on mental health uh, impacts in particular. And then I'll go over some data and some models um, suggesting how intergenerational trauma may impact youth biology, both uh, in the body and the brain. And then uh, finally, I'll show you some of emerging work in my lab and others about how trauma may be affecting maturation of brain systems in youth uh, and, and the pace of that maturation. Before I dig into all that, though, I do want to acknowledge uh, the Wisconsin First Nations in that the UW-Madison and, and where I'm presenting uh, to you from now is on uh, traditional Ho-Chunk lands. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of work to be done uh, for the states as well as our federal government in um, uh, respecting uh, the, the many original treaties that were set up. So let's start out uh, talking about the impacts of trauma in youth. Uh, and, and we have data in adults as well. So we know that toxic stress and particularly ACEs, so these are adverse childhood experiences for, for those of you not familiar with that term, increase the risk for numerous child health outcomes. Uh, I don't intend for to, to go through this whole list here, but really just to show you that it's an extensive list. Many of these are physical health problems, but there are also a number 
of mental health problems too, including uh, depression, uh, sleep problems, and suicide attempts. What hasn't been traditionally included in the list of ACEs, and uh, at least in um, psychological and neuroscience studies, racism. And the American Academy of Pediatrics acknowledged uh, or released a statement in 2019 uh, stating that racism is a social determinant of health that has a profound impact uh, not only on children and adolescents, but also the entire family. And when we think about the ACE pyramid, the adverse childhood experiences pyramid, uh, on the left is the traditional pyramid that um, Vincent Filetti and, and colleagues uh, came up with. And the idea is that adverse childhood experiences, uh, such as the, the death of a, a parent, a uh, parent with serious mental illness, uh, forms of abuse, uh, et cetera, can really uh, start or precipitate a cascade of difficulties that may start with social, emotional, or cognitive impairment, which then can lead to health risk behaviors, uh, and down the road, diseases, uh, mental, physical health problems, and even early death. Now that pyramid looks quite a bit different in uh, marginalized communities that have been uh, really subject to conditions, uh, traumatic experiences, but also conditions that are very stressful and, and remove many of these supports uh, throughout generations. And so the base of that pyramid is actually much wider than I think was uh, appreciated uh, when, when the ACE pyramid first came out. Uh, and this will go into a little bit more in terms of biology, uh, how that may be transmitted across generations. But there's also the, the, the social conditions um, that, that have really been um, put at a major disadvantage for our marginalized uh, communities, particularly uh, BIPOC communities. So how is toxic stress impacting the body and the brain throughout life? And how might that be transmitted then across generations? So we know that adversity, trauma, and childhood impacts genes, gene regulation, gene expression, in ways that can then lead to changes in stress response systems in the, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. This, for example, this is um, uh, the, the stress hormone axis, if you will, which can then also go on to impact how the brain is structured, how the brain develops, how it's functioning uh, in a way that may make it more stress reactive, as we'll see. That, of course, as we talked about, can influence a number of outcomes in adults, both physical and mental health problems. But there's also, as we'll get into shortly, increasing evidence that uh, those stress exposures and changes in genes, changes in behaviors are then being transmitted to the next generation, or at least can be transmitted to the next generation, even starting in the womb. So prenatally, uh, some of that programming may be happening, uh, particularly depending on the amount of stress exposure that mom and dad have had. So let's go into that a little bit. One of the pathways by which this seems to be happening is through genetic transmission. And you may be wondering, well, how can uh, stress change genes actually to be transmitted from parents to their children? And one of the ways that this happens is through a process called epigenetics. And this is, it entails a modification of gene expression. So it's not changing the actual code of the DNA itself, but it's changing uh, how that DNA may be expressed, how those genes may be expressed, either reducing the expression of genes or in some cases, increasing the expression of genes. And methylation is one of the, the main ways that this happens. And it's, it's, it's essentially like a tagging of DNA that makes it more or less likely to be uh, converted into protein. And that can affect the, the body as well as the brain. We also have increasing evidence that um, stress exposure and uh, in the, shown in the middle here is one of the, the most important factors affecting uh, sperm in particular uh, with uh, less data or less understood about how stress exposure may be uh, affecting 
uh, mom's eggs. But in affecting sperm, you're now potentially affecting uh, a good portion of the DNA uh, that that child will be receiving. And what do we know uh, so far about this kind of intergenerational transmission through, through genetic pathways? So there are some uh, initial studies from uh, Rachel Yehuda's group and others showing that there are biological changes in the offspring of cortisol, or sorry, of uh, Holocaust survivors, uh, which is a, a group she's worked closely with. But these can change stress response systems. It can uh, lead to lower cortisol levels. This is uh, a stress hormone that's uh, often released and used to mount a stress response, higher cortisol receptor sensitivity, and altered methylation of cortisol receptor genes. And these changes, amongst others, are associated with more behavioral and emotional difficulties. So there's actually biological evidence now that stress can be and is being transmitted across generations and can have a major impact on youth and subsequent generations. Now, genetics isn't the only pathway by which this is happening. Uh, for uh, clinicians in the audience, you will certainly know that modeling of behaviors is also critically important uh, for transmission of stress and for youth to be learning about their environment and particularly um, in the sense of threat learning. Uh, this is something that uh, we have begun to study in my lab, and, and I'll show you some data from other labs as well. Uh, so this modeling behavior is in addition to, we think, the epigenetic or genetic changes that uh, are also mediating some of this um, intergenerational risk. So I want to start with a study. This is by um, a group at Emory, where they looked at the impacts of maternal trauma and PTSD on threat and safety learning uh, in African-American diets. So, so in this case, uh, moms and their children. And what they show on the left is a, a profile of four different groups that were identified based on their types of trauma exposure and PTSD symptoms. Um, and so in, in blue, there's a relatively low trauma group where uh, the, the levels or the severity of trauma exposure is low across all of these different categories from sexual abuse going to emotional neglect that you see in the bottom. There's another group in gray here who had high sexual abuse exposure as children. Again, these are the moms that we're talking about. Uh, a moderate trauma group and then a group uh, shown in yellow with high trauma and PTSD symptoms. They then looked at the children of these moms and found some really uh, notable differences in how they were able to learn or differentiate threat versus safety cues uh, that, they, that they did in an experimental paradigm. Uh, so what I'm showing you here, uh, I'll, I'll highlight further, but um, what I'm showing you on the right are startle magnitudes. These are, these are uh, fear-related uh, startle reactions to these cues that were associated with uh, some mild aversive stimulus that, that we could consider threat. And so the orange bars represent the conditioned response to those threat, whereas the, the blue bars represent the safety cue. And so what you would normally expect is a pattern like this, where in uh, typical learning, you would see greater reactivity to uh, a cue, whether it's a sound or uh, a light that's been associated with a negative outcome before, right? So these the kids from uh, moms with lower trauma exposure or, or even moderate trauma exposure show that great reactivity to the threat versus the safety cue. But there's something very different in kids of moms who had either high sexual abuse exposure or a high trauma load and PTSD symptoms, again, but where the, where the moms had these exposures. And the kids in these situations or for, with, with those uh, moms uh, aren't differentiating these threat and safety cues. So there, there's a nearly similar uh, magnitude of startle response to each of them. Uh, now, as we'll talk about, that may be very adaptive. If, if it's a dangerous environment, it may actually be quite adaptive uh, to consider a lot of things as a potential threat and not call something 
uh, as safe. That, of course, has uh, potential negative consequences too down the road in that uh, it may be something that leads to PTSD if uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, fear reactions uh, across the board and in an environment going on. And uh, what I want to tell you about now is one of the studies that we have embarked on in my lab, um, looking at how parents may be transmitting this information and in turn how their kids are learning from them. So we know, as I talked about, that youth learn many threat and safety associations from their parents. This is a really important set of uh, information to, for kids to learn from their parents. It tells them about the environment and, and whether it's safe or not. And we know that parent modeling can both increase or decrease anxiety in kids. And for kids uh, or parents with anxiety disorders, things like social anxiety or generalized anxiety, we also know that parent and family coaching can reduce the transmission of risk of those anxiety disorders from parents to kids. So, so these model behaviors are changeable. They're, they're, they're moldable through uh, interventions as well. And what we're working with is a model on the right, uh, studying uh, youth with post-traumatic stress disorder in particular, um, and looking at the impacts of different types of learning. And here we're talking about extinction. Now, what, what is extinction? Uh, it's, it's not the, the extinction of dinosaurs type of thing we're talking about. It's, it's actually a form of learning or unlearning uh, a fear memory in this case. And direct extinction is a process whereby kids are learning uh, on their own through, say, repeated exposures. Or in therapy, we talk about, about going through a trauma narrative, that through um, repeating that process multiple times, assuming the, the children are in a safe uh, environment uh, leads to extinguishing a reduction of those fear reactions to the fear memory or to the trauma memory in this case. Uh, and then there's a vicarious extinction process where uh, recounting those uh, behaviors and watching, say, a parent's response may be very important as well uh, in uh, how that child, whether that child extinguishes a trauma memory or not. And so what we think might be happening in part in youth who develop and, and continue to have PTSD is that there may be impairments in both of these processes. They may have difficulty extinguishing the trauma memory on their own, but their parent may also be uh, either modeling, they may have higher fear reactions themselves and that's being transmitted to youth, or perhaps there are situations where the parent is actually modeling uh, more of a safety response, that they're not reactive, but for some reason the child isn't um, taking that information in. So how do we actually test this in the lab? Well, we've, uh, with some collaborators, developed a paradigm where uh, we pair colored lights with uh, a very mild aversive stimulus um, that the, the kids actually choose the intensity of. So, so they're very much in control uh, of this process. Um, and uh, two of the lights get paired uh, with an aversive uh, stimulation on the skin. Uh, another light color does not, in this case, yellow. And then they go through the, the extinction process where they see these lights again, uh, but without any of the, the aversive stimulus uh, coming in. Uh, and they do that either just by watching the, the stimuli on their own through direct extinction, or in the example uh, under day two on the right, uh, by watching their uh, parent uh, go through the same process. So now they're having to really monitor how uh, mom in this case might be responding to that. And then we bring them back a day later and see uh, what their reactions to these stimuli are. In other words, how well do they uh, retain and recall that the, the, the extinction of the, that fear response. Uh, and interestingly, what we've seen in some of our preliminary data, and, the, and these, this is a small group uh, of youth so far, is that it's the response on day three to the vicariously extinguished uh, uh, Q that really seems to be important for mapping onto child PTSD symptoms, um, which was a bit of a surprise to us. We expected both the, the directly and vicariously extinguished Q to be important here. Uh, but it seems, at least in, in this initial sample, that um, what youth are uh, really learning um, 
from their parents is, is critically important in uh, terms of how severe their PTSD may be. Uh, of course, again, I think our clinicians will, will uh, not be surprised by this at all, uh, knowing that parents are, are really a critical part uh, of this process. So thinking about treatment, how could this kind of information be used? And this is just a theoretical treatment algorithm, uh, but it, the, some of the, the potential translation of this kind of work is that uh, we could look at use direct um, or use extinction learning uh, shown on the left-hand side uh, in orange. And if there were difficulties with direct extinction, so learning to um, really extinguish the, the trauma memory on their own, then perhaps really the focus is on exposure therapy for youth themselves. If there are problems with vicarious extinction, then we would need to review uh, what's going on with the caregiver and, and child during this modeled uh, extinction learning. Uh, and that's shown then on the right. So if, if there are uh, problems with the parent's own direct extinction, for example, or the caregiver, then we might consider focusing on exposure therapy uh, for the caregiver themselves or and or dyadic modeling um, uh, of, for uh, the caregiver to appropriately uh, signal uh, threat and safety for the children. Now, if that process is working okay, in the caregiver, then perhaps really there's something about the, the youth not really taking that information in um, and, and using it to, to help recover. And, and so perhaps there are situations where uh, we may actually work with the youth to better identify what their caregivers may be expressing uh, or feeling in certain situations. Um, so that's, it's a long way down the road, but this is at least um, how we could uh, consider or think about uh, implementing that in the clinic. So let's switch gears uh, just a bit and talk about neurodevelopment and how trauma may be impacting neurodevelopment in youth. Now, we know that brain development is ongoing through early adulthood. This is a slide uh, showing uh, structural brain development. So there's a natural process called cortical thinning, which happens through adolescence uh, and actually goes out to about age 25 on average. And some of the last parts of the brain to mature or, or complete this thinning are actually the ones that are responsible for our executive function. So controlling, uh, regulating our emotions, uh, maintaining attention and focus. And this is critically important because these are uh, a lot of the, the skills or functions that uh, kids need to be uh, successful, but also to be um, uh, emotionally well off, we think. Uh, when we look at functional brain development, we also see that this is similarly ongoing through early adulthood. So on the left, we see that amygdala activation decreases with age, again, uh, going out to age um, uh, 25 nearly in this sample. Uh, and over that same period, the connectivity, the connection between the amygdala and areas of the prefrontal cortex uh, are getting stronger as well. So it's uh, more evidence that these really important regulatory circuits are uh, strengthening as kids uh, age. Um, and many of you may know the, the amygdala is considered really the, the brain's fear response center, whereas the prefrontal cortex, that, that executive network I was talking about earlier is important for regulating those amygdala responses and those threat responses. So if this is the typical pattern, if you will, how might adversity or ACEs in childhood be impacting uh, development in the body and the brain? And we know from uh, a number of studies at this point that there are impacts on the body. So the number of threat experiences that a child has while growing up is associated with more advanced pubertal stage, the so earlier onset of puberty as well. We also see similar findings with genetic age. So remember the methylation of genes or tagging of genes that I talked to you about earlier uh, also changes. And in a way that uh, reflects uh, a more advanced or later age of the DNA itself. Uh, and again, the, this is tied with the number of threat experiences that children have been through uh, that's actually aging the DNA. 
We also have initial evidence that um, moms, uh, ACEs or, or adverse childhood experiences as well as prenatal stress can impact uh, genetics or, or the child's genes even as a newborn. Uh, so here are some, some data suggesting that uh, mom's ACEs are associated with uh, decreased telomere length. But what are telomeres? These are uh, like little shoelace caps that protect the DNA actually from aging. And, and the shorter that the telomeres get, the more uh, aged the DNA is. So clearly there's uh, evidence at this point that adversity in childhood is accelerating biological aging. And again, uh, early evidence for the intergenerational impact as well. So those are some of the impacts on the body, but how might this be affecting brain development? And I wanna talk with you a little bit about um, a parameter or, or, or a measure that we call brain age. Um, and this is shorthand for a brain age gap estimate. So using machine learning uh, and other advanced statistical models, we can actually predict the, the age of the brain itself relative to a child's chronological age. Now, why might that be important? Well, in this graph on the left-hand side, there's a, a, this gray arrow is uh, something that might represent healthy aging. Uh, and then in red is a case where there might be an inter environmental insult, uh, to a trauma, for example. And that might, through some of these mechanisms we just talked about, might alter uh, the pace of how the brain is aging. And if that's really uh, shifted uh, too far from a healthy aging trajectory, that might uh, lead to symptoms, uh, mental health symptoms in this case, uh, down the road. So I'm gonna show you some data from a study that we've run that um, is uh, in, in revision to uh, hopefully will be published soon, uh, looking at how trauma or stress exposure may impact uh, brain structural brain aging in this case. Uh, so how do we actually do that? Well, you can take a bunch of um, healthy brains or brains, I should say, from youth who don't have uh, any clear psychiatric or mental health problems uh, and use that to build a model or an algorithm as, as is shown in the middle. And then you can then use that algorithm to, to try to estimate the brain ages of youth who are outside of the sample or who may, be, uh, may have had trauma exposure or may have mental health symptoms. And so we did that. This work was led by Taylor Kading, who's uh, one of my graduate students and uh, also defended his dissertation recently and graduating soon. Um, but we uh, used, uh, looked at a sample of, in this case, 246 girls, and this is a, a multi-site study. And we looked at how structural brain maturity may or may not be different in girls uh, who are resilient and vulnerable following abuse exposure. Um, and here we're defining uh, girls as resilient if they hadn't developed any internalizing disorders. So these are the anxiety, depression, PTSD. This was predominantly a sample with internalizing disorders or vulnerable if they had developed an internalizing disorder. And then we looked at different circuits in the brain. So we looked at the, the brain as a whole and we looked at emotion circuitry specifically. And then as another comparison circuit, we looked at language circuitry. And what Taylor found is that interestingly, neither whole brain or language circuitry brain age were any different in girls who were resilient, uh, shown in red, or susceptible, shown in purple, as compared to typically developing girls. Uh, however, in emotion circuitry, which is, which is shown in panel B, the brain age was significantly reduced. In other words, emotion circuit maturity was delayed in girls who had been victims of abuse, whether they had developed mental health symptoms or not, suggesting that uh, this may be actually a common response uh, in terms of brain maturation to abuse exposure. And then in panel D, the, the, the more delayed that uh, brain maturity was in this case, the more hyperarousal symptoms that these girls tended to have. 
So again, this suggests to us that this may be actually a general adaptive mechanism to growing up in a potentially uh, or in a, in a dangerous environment. And it would make a lot of sense that um, it would be associated with more hyperarousal symptoms as well. Now, the other interesting um, feature of this or aspect of this that we looked at is that um, there were differences in how brain regions contributed to these maturation patterns in resilient uh, as, as opposed to vulnerable girls. And in the resilient group, uh, what we saw was that there was actually increased maturity in the brain's executive networks. Remember, this is a, a, a network of, of brain regions that's really important for regulating emotion. Uh, on the other hand, we saw a decreased maturity in the resilient group in the threat network. So areas like uh, the insula, the very close to uh, the amygdala as well, but, but indicating that um, actually it's not just whether the, the, the whole network itself is advanced or delayed in its maturity, but it's how these different regions are contributing that may matter. On the other hand, in girls who are vulnerable or who have developed internalizing problems, we saw increased maturity in this case in the threat network and uh, decreased maturity in the hippocampus. And the, the hippocampus is a really important region for learning and memory, but it's also very uh, well known for its role in putting the brakes on fear responses as well through, through connections with the amygdala. Uh, so it seems that the, the patterns of maturation are really seem to be really important uh, for how girls may do, in this case, after exposure to abuse. So uh, I've thrown a lot of neuroscience data at you, but uh, just to, to summarize, uh, trauma exposure does appear to delay brain maturation, specifically in emotion circuits in youth, or at least in this case in, in girls who have been exposed to abuse. But there are also unique patterns of brain maturation that really may determine whether uh, youth go on to develop uh, mental health problems or not. Uh, so the, those will be some other uh, important things for us to consider uh, going forward. So finally, I uh, want to talk just a bit about um, how or whether trauma-focused treatment may alter these neurodevelopmental patterns in youth. Um, ideally, right, our therapies would be working in a way that would um, either enlist some compensatory responses in brain development or uh, put uh, a child's brain development back on uh, a healthy trajectory. And we know from some of our the work in our lab in, uh, in, in youth with PTSD that the amygdala prefrontal connection is an important part of the story. So we know, functionally speaking, that when youth or kids with PTSD are viewing threat images, that they have decreased coupling or connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. We also see that over time, shown on the right, uh, youth with PTSD show declining connectivity in this circuit, which is uh, quite different from the typically developing or TD group shown in blue, where that connectivity strength normally uh, increases over time. This, in this case, this is from rest, resting state uh, functional MRI data. So not only do youth with PTSD seem to start off, um, or at least start off uh, when we've assessed them, uh, have uh, reduced connectivity between the amygdala and, and the prefrontal cortex, this important regulatory node, that pattern seems to accentuate over time. So how might that change though in youth who actually remit from PTSD and, and Hopefully our therapies have uh, something to do with this as well, right? What we found in, in one of our studies when we differentiated over time, whether youth per persisted in having PTSD or remitted by the follow-up period, which was about a year later, uh, we saw that youth who remitted from PTSD showed expansion. This is a, a brain structure now uh, of the prefrontal cortex. So both in the frontal pole area of the brain shown on the left, uh, and then here as well in an area called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, um, uh, here an expansion of thickness. 
And the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is an interesting area because it has very direct connections to the amygdala. And the more this region expanded, the lower uh, kids' anxiety symptoms were over the course of a year. So there seems to be something really important about this amygdala prefrontal circuit that um, we could potentially harness in therapy and, and in turn see whether our therapies are uh, modifying over time. And some interesting um, aspects of the amygdala prefrontal cortex circuit is that it regulates our autonomic balance. So when these regions are in balance, we see the two branches of the autonomic nervous system uh, acting uh, in concert and fairly evenly. So there's the parasympathetic nervous system uh, here shown in the left uh, towards the, the, the blue side of the bar. And this is an anti-inflammatory system. It's involved in relaxation and, and soothing responses. Uh, if you ever do say uh, meditation or uh, deep breathing exercises, what you're doing is you're engaging your parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, and, and it's calming your entire body down. It's reducing uh, cytokines, stress hormones that are being released. As opposed to the sympathetic nervous system, which is really our stress response, our initiating our fight or flight response, as well as uh, hormones and inflammatory molecules that, that might be needed. And this is all in the interest of the body mounting a response to, to a challenge or a threat in the environment. But under conditions of chronic stress and, and presumably the, the amygdala prefrontal cortex um, dysfunction or, or being out of balance is part of this, that um, really gets, the, the, the autonomic response gets weighed towards the sympathetic nervous system where there is now uh, a heightened pro-inflammatory uh, response as well as uh, the stress uh, endocrine responses uh, the, like cortisol, for example. And while that may be uh, useful in an acute stressor, it can be quite toxic uh, over the long term if there are chronic and repeated stressors, and as we've talked about intergenerational uh, stressors and traumas as well. So how might we actually target this in a therapeutic setting in the clinic? Um, one of the studies that we're working on that I'm really excited about uh, is being led by a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Justin Russell. And what he's doing, and, and we're working with um, collaborators uh, who uh, uh, come from a company called uh, Deep VR. So this is virtual reality. And they have uh, created this really incredible platform that uses an underwater environment and through a respiratory belt offers feedback and, and teaches youth to, to breathe essentially more diaphragmatically, more, uh, more deeply uh, at a slower pace. And the more that they do that, it leads them through this underwater environment. Uh, so let me play uh, a clip here just to show you.
So we're uh, really excited um, about uh, using virtual reality uh, in particular um, uh, because it's a, it's a format that we think will readily engage youth who, uh, again, as our clinicians know, are probably oftentimes hesitant to come into therapy and talk about uh, the many bad things that might have happened to them. Uh, so we're hoping that this will be an engaging way uh, that's very uh, non-threatening for kids to be able to come in and regulate their breathing and in turn regulate their prefrontal cortex amygdala connection and their autonomic nervous systems in a way that may uh, really help them uh, to recover and uh, really harness the inherent resilience uh, that these youth have. Uh, so hopefully we'll be starting this pilot uh, in uh, the next couple of months. So a um, couple of summary slides, and then I'd like to open it up for uh, any audience questions that there might be. Um, so we know that there's bad news, um, that we, with increasing evidence that racism, trauma affect biological and brain development. We also know that trauma is being carried across generations through biology, through the environment, as well as through stress on parents and, and in turn how parents may be modeling uh, threat and safety. And then finally, we see some early evidence that childhood trauma is accelerating not only body aging, um, but actually may delay emotion circuits that are critical for uh, adaptive uh, coping in the long run. Now, the good news is that kids are very resilient and their brains are very resilient. And we've, we've seen that in our neuroimaging studies to date as well, where we follow kids over time. And this gives me a lot of hope because that uh, allows us an opportunity to intervene and to boost resilience in kids and the whole family system. Uh, I, I would argue that extends to communities as well. Um, but certainly this is gonna have to include the dismantling of structural and individual uh, racism uh, to change the environment as well, to be one that's more uh, promote, promoting of uh, health and well-being, uh, particularly for our marginalized communities. So with that, I will stop and uh, see if there are questions from the audience. We can open it up. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you so, so very much. Um, I have, it's a good thing I was on mute because I was making all kinds of sounds and oohs and ahs with, yeah. with everything because um, I think with resiliency and it really is so complementary to what Rainbow, you know, we can't really work in the field of trauma without looking at protective factors and developing to protective factors and resiliency, um, particularly with uh, younger children, but I see this as, and I, I want to call it something like, this is really a breakthrough in terms of using science in a way that is so positive. It's, it's really this, um, I don't know what the <clears throat> words are, but it's really this innovative redefining of science in a way that will help us in a practical way uh, and in a positive way and not in this deficit model way. And that mm -hmm. I think is really important. Um, we talk a great deal about stigma in mental health. And this is really uh, one of the ways that I think in many um, circumstances that we see, resilience is formed because of the, um, <clears throat> the oppression uh, and mm -hmm. some of the other factors that actually strengthens. Uh, them and we've talked about that before in terms of trauma, uh, developing mm. that kind of courage and resiliency. So I really do uh, appreciate that that bottom line of um, not stigmatizing uh, mm -hmm. and and really, if anything, giving so much more practical uh, hope on that. And um, just wondering more too about the generations and what we can do for parents. Um, you know, Rainbow often is, has always been working with the child and the parent and the dyad and sometimes with grandparents as well. Is this something too that can be, um, how can that help in terms of the generations that we're, we're thinking about? Because what we're hoping is building the strength of those 
care, care, caregivers in order to really sustain and maintain that progress with the children. Yeah, those are such great points, Cheryl. And, and I, I completely agree with getting away from this deficit model. You know, if we, if we see changes in, in the brain or the body, you know, that, that's the brain and the body trying to adapt. And, and, and in many cases, adapting to a very stressful and, and, and potentially threatening environment. Mm -hmm. And it's, to me, it just shows a remarkable degree of strength in resilience. And, and then we, we see the, the plasticity and flexibility of the brain, even as uh, kids are developing. Um, to your question in terms of the, you know, how do we strengthen families and communities? That's, there's a lot of aspects to that, I think, uh, but certainly uh, I think working with caregivers, with, with the family unit to really harness their strengths, I think is important in this resilience framework you're talking about that um, families and, and communities have really uh, developed in a way that um, they, they are using many aspects, many strengths, many coping skills to try to get by, uh, oftentimes in a very stressful environment and, and where opportunities have been limited as well. Uh, but I think highlighting why those responses or reactions may often be there and, and normalizing that it can be really helpful for caregivers, for family members. Um, one of the books I really uh, am still so impressed with is, is Dr. Joy DeGruy's work on post-traumatic slave syndrome. And, and she highlights how many behaviors may have been transmitted across generations, but in a way to try to protect uh, children, children and, and families from the impacts of slavery and oppression, for example. So, so there, again, she, she's reframing um, many of the behaviors that may have been learned or passed on over generations, but in a way that's trying to protect uh, people and, and families. And I think that's just so critical. Uh, so I think it, to the extent we can highlight that is really important. And then certainly at a larger societal level, there's a lot of work to be done in, in actually changing the conditions so that um, these you know, families can be supported um, in, in, in the way they deserve. I also think that the science is, is a way of <clears throat> really empowering knowledge. Uh, and uh, there are uh, different kinds of materials and resources we use to really help kids, even younger children, <clears throat> understand brain development and why are they being triggered because of earlier traumas and normalizing that um, and doing the same with adults that I think that's where the science and what you're doing is really going to be helpful for uh, folks in, in terms of empowering. There is a question from Anne. She is saying, does the efficacy of therapy uh, decay depending on the age of the person receiving it? And also, is it less effective if more time passes since the, when the trauma actually occurred? That's a really good question, Anne. I, I would say the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> it's, um, I, I think there's a, you know, a suspicion, at least in the neuroscience community, that maybe because kids' brains are more plastic or flexible and still developing, that they, they might be able to better respond to therapy. Um, but I haven't, uh, and maybe other audience members will We'll know of some other studies. I, I'm not aware of data showing whether therapy is more effective in youth versus adults, for example. Uh, there's some literature in, uh, at least for, for trauma-related disorders, I think there's, there's some literature in anxiety and depressive disorders suggesting that actually the benefits are similar, at least across the um, childhood to say mid-adult lifespan years. And you also addressed the um, stability in some ways that a person is in at the time. Um, if we look at um, Dr. Seth Pollack's work uh, in resiliency where um, 
sometimes when it depends on the environment that they're in, that sometimes those things will come out more uh, and almost go in hibernation when they are in a more threatening uh, kind of environment. So that might make a difference as well in terms of perhaps retrieving or being able to uncover some of those memories. Judith also asked, could you please post the author and book about post-slavery trauma transmission? Certainly, I'll put that in the, uh, the chat for everyone. Yeah, thanks Judith. And then also uh, Jessica is asking, trauma-informed care is definitely a current gap in nursing education as well as clinical practice. How would you recommend a large organization first go about introducing a culture of trauma-informed care to clinical staff? Um, many staff seem open to the information and research, but lack the knowledge and skills necessary to incorporate it into daily practice. That's a yeah, great question. That really is a great question. Yeah, I, I think um, a lot of it starts with uh, the education piece and um, educating uh, particular healthcare practitioners about the prevalence of trauma and some of the common reactions to trauma exposure. And, and for many of the clients that we deal with or work with, I should say, uh, those trauma exposures have been chronic, uh, repeated over the lifetime and, and probably started, in many cases, started early. And so really the, the trauma-informed lens is about um, viewing behaviors through uh, that lens, right? That, that uh, individuals may be acting the way they do or responding the way they do because of these prior life experiences. So there may be a very good reason for that um, in, in really instilling some curiosity and in, in, in patience in us as healthcare providers. So I know there are curricula uh, out there for trauma-informed care, and Jill mm -hmm. can probably speak to that more, more than I can. Uh, there's certainly some uh, curricula being implemented at the UW uh, as well. Well, I think it is a great question and something that we are looking at when we have our trauma, uh, our annual trauma summits to look at different systems, uh, including healthcare, to really look at those systems and see how um, it is really a, a stress relief to try to really look into this. Uh, from, from all aspects of it. Um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has some really um, nice research uh, on what you can do to begin uh, looking at that, looking at your own organization uh, with an assessment. Um, it could be the teaching system, it could be law enforcement, it could be in other ways that um, they really are helpful. Uh, so that might be really a good start in you knowing your systems best. <clears throat> and um, they have some for different modules that are for busy uh, professionals and systems that they know are not always going to be able to um, do that kind of long research. But I think that those are some of the good starting points um, with that. And also to talk about um, secondary trauma and vicarious trauma, particularly for health professionals during COVID, um, because it really is that ability to be available when you also, <clears throat> you're also treating yourself and looking at yourself in that lens. Yeah, that, that's really well said, Cheryl. Yeah, and just to, to second the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, they, they really do have nice resources on this at nctsn.org if folks want to search for it. Okay, any other last words, Ryan? Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here and I, I hope, um, I, I know I threw a lot of neuroscience at folks, so hopefully <laughs> it's gonna be uh, a bit intimidating, especially at uh, 5.30, you know, 6.30 in the, in, in the evening. So thanks to everyone for being here, uh, for the work that you all do in helping families and youth to, um, to really harness the, the resilience that they all have within them. So thank you. Thank you, Ryan, so much. Thank you. Um, we're just very impressed and appreciate that you are in our community uh, and feel very fortunate 
um, that you are. Um, I, I do hope that um, folks will remember that there is um, uh, a series uh, next Wednesday as well uh, with uh, Celia Huerta and uh, Fabiola Hamden uh, to, talk, uh, to talk about the impact on uh, the Latino community uh, and uh, the importance of focusing on their particular struggles, traumas, and needs, as well as their strengths. So um, again, thank you so much. And um, we hope to see everyone next Wednesday, but thank you again, uh, Dr. Ryan Haranga. And I wish we had like a, an orchestra and audience <laughs> clapping <laughs> for you because I feel so much smarter. <laughs> after hearing your presentation. So thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Cheryl.